Hi, I'm Billy Shore. After publishing more than 140 episodes of Add Passion and Stir and speaking with at least 250 remarkable guests, we've created more than 70 hours of original content covering a wide range of topics, including leadership, inclusion, food equity, national security, overcoming adversity, and of course, ending childhood hunger. After the mass shooting tragedies in Dayton and El Paso, particularly given the racial animus expressed in Texas, we thought it was important to showcase our conversations around the issue of immigration and diversity. In reviewing these discussions, I was struck by how greatly they differ from the red-hot and divisive rhetoric we hear day in and day out. The president's comments about four female members of the House of Representatives, all women of color, and the vitriol that those comments unleashed are one of the more recent examples of how far we are from being able to talk about issues of race, diversity, and immigration in a civil and constructive manner. It doesn't have to be that way. Our conversations on Add Passion and Stir with guests from remarkably diverse backgrounds have tackled questions of race, inequality, and opportunity in ways that point to a more hopeful future. If you're tired of the national conversation being played out on cable news channels that seems to reach a new low every week, listen to these podcast excerpts from conversations in which the goal is to actually learn something that we didn't know before, not score political points on behalf of one party or the other. When you listen to this very special episode of Add Passion and Stir, I hope you'll hear what I think is a better way to converse. Positive words of hope without the rancor and bitterness that's frequently directed at the people and policymakers at the heart of this issue. We'll revisit conversations with chef and founder of humanitarian aid organization World Central Kitchen, Jose Andreas. You can build any wall you want to keep people out. If people are hungry, people will go over the wall, around the wall, or under the wall. This is not a way forward. Also, Oxfam America's president and CEO, Abby Maxman. But we can't give up, even when we're feeling uh, concerned or, or overwhelmed by the statistics and the numbers, because every life and every individual matters. Former Secretary of the Army, Louis Caldera. I think that, that the diversity that our nation has is a tremendous asset. And the truth is, it's only going to grow in diversity because of the smaller, smaller planet that we occupy. And that's a good thing. And former Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell. And you have to think about how much our country has benefited from immigration, how, how immigrants have brought new life, new energy, new views. Think about just a couple of facts. In 2016, seven Americans got the Nobel Prize. Six of them were immigrants. We'll also have the president and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, Marco Davis. You know, diversity is uh, being invited to the party, right? But inclusion is being asked to dance. America has a complicated and painful history with diversity. Immigrants who were drawn here by the hope of a better life were frequently not welcome. Here's former Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell on our difficult history of racism and bigotry, his own family of immigrants, and our hope for the future. Well, the first point to make is that there's nothing new about discrimination, about stereotyping, about hostility to immigrants. And it's important to establish context. Human beings first appeared on the earth 300,000 years ago, but they spread very slowly around the world. It was not until about 15,000 years ago that they reached what is now North America. So the fact is that everybody somewhere came from somewhere else. I mean, at some point in history. It wasn't until about five, well, the, the, the early groups spread and became what we know as the Native Americans across all of North, Central, and South America. The Europeans came about 500 years ago. And for centuries, the British, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, and the Native Americans fought for control of North America. A series of wars occurred, most of them small local, but ultimately the British prevailed in North America and then the what were two, the two major colonies ultimately spun off into the United States and Canada. For about 100 years, uh, we had a vast continent. We had only a few million people. Uh, we welcomed people from everywhere to try to fill the vast continent. But it didn't eliminate racial stereotyping and attitudes. Every group that's come here has suffered from it. Uh, my father's parents came from Ireland. And we all know from Irish history that all across New York, Philadelphia, Boston, signs were up, Irish need not apply. Cartoons were published showing them the body of an ape with the face of a human, depicting them as subhuman. Italians were stereotyped with the crimes of a few imputed 
to all of them. No group in America has suffered discrimination longer and more harshly than Jews other than African Americans, who are the only group who were brought here involuntarily in cages and chains and subjected to slavery and discrimination for centuries. Jews were discriminated against until fairly quite recently in our society in, a, in an incredible way. Catholics, we, we think of the Ku Klux Klan because of its violent actions against African Americans in the South in the late 19th century, but the Klan actually reached its peak in the North in the 1920s on a program of virulent anti-Semitism and anti Catholicism. So what's happening now isn't new, but we've been able to overcome it. Each group had some who withstood the hostility, who grabbed the bottom rung of the ladder of success in American life and pulled themselves up and pulled us up along with it. My father was the orphan son of Irish immigrants. He never knew his parents. He was raised in an orphanage, adopted by an elderly childless couple. He had little education. He left school after the third or fourth grade and worked ultimately as a janitor at a local college. My mother was an immigrant from Lebanon, born to a Christian family there, and there were periodic religious disputes that led to a great deal of migration to the United States. She found herself uh, living with her sister in a tenement building next door to my father's family in, in a town in Maine, and every, my mother worked 50 years nights in a textile mill. 50 years in a textile mill, 11 o'clock at night till 7 in the morning. My parents were very poor, died penniless, but in their minds they were successful because their children got an education, and thanks to the openness of American society, we have all led lives far beyond my parents' imagination. And so my, my view is, and you have to think about how much our country has benefited from immigration, how, how immigrants have brought new life, new energy, new views. Think about just a couple of facts. In 2016, seven Americans got the Nobel Prize. Six of them were immigrants. Think of the, the fact that uh, arguably the three most successful businesses and three of the most successful businesses in the world today are Apple, Amazon, and Google. Apple was created by Steve Jobs, whose father was born in Syria. Amazon by Jeff Bezos, whose adoptive father was born in Cuba. And one of the co-founders of Google was Sergey Brin, who himself was born in Russia. And so ask yourself, would we be a better country if they hadn't gotten in? But ask yourself also, what are the chances that if Steve Jobs had lived his life in Syria, he would have created Apple? Or Jeff Bezos in Cuba? Or Sergey Brin in Russia? Genius knows no language, no race, no religion. It can be found wherever there are human beings, but it tends to flourish where there is freedom, opportunity, where anybody can rise despite their background, and that's really America, a place of innovation, and that's what we need. And there's this, this current attitude of imputing to immigrants all the negative stereotypes is absolutely not new. It has existed for 200 years in our country, and some have sought to exploit the differences, as we're seeing now, but ultimately I think we have overcome every wave of this hostility, and we've emerged a more diverse, larger, stronger, better country. Louis Caldera, the former Secretary of the Army, also shared the story of his childhood growing up as the son of immigrants, and he gave his perspective on the value of diversity in our nation. My parents were immigrants from Mexico. We were the family that ate tortillas and frijoles and uh, chile rellenos and all this food that my friends didn't eat. Um, and at that at that time, the the what today we'd call Latino, Mexican-American population was maybe just about 5% of the population. So it was, you were, you, you stood out. You were the, you were the different, uh, the different uh, family. Uh, and it was really part of, of bringing the family together. And it was also really great because when we would travel back to Mexico in the summers to visit extended family and stuff, uh, my mom was from Chihuahua, from Northern Chihuahua, Mexico, yeah. and my dad from, from Zacatecas. So, but I, you know, but I grew up in this, in this uh, Spanish-speaking immigrant, poor, uh, struggling family. And I really kind of understood that public po education was going to be kind of my ticket out. I needed to do well in school. And that public policy that, you know, things like the, the war on poverty um, were the great society. Those were programs that were very much being talked about, the civil rights movement, that uh, those are things that I believed in and wanted to be a part of. And that the way that you could make an impact was through 
public service. You know, it started with going to West Point, and and that was in part because West Point was free. So not only was it a great education, you could be an Army officer, serve your country, but it was free. As a uh, high school student, uh, I knew I wanted to go to college, um, and I knew that my parents didn't have a nickel. Uh, My older sister was in college. They didn't have money for her. Uh, She was working and living at home and contributed to the family. So I, I looked around and said, well, I need a full ride, and one of the places that I heard from was West Point, and it said, you can serve your country, you can be an army officer, you can learn about leadership, you can, we have an honor code, lots of things that appealed to me. It was a great experience to get a, to go across the country, far from home, meet uh, young, at the time, just men. Uh, women came two years later, but meet uh, students from all over the country who also wanted to, to serve their country uh, in the military. And then and then while, while I was really open to serving in the military, you know, there, there was a part of me that wanted to serve closer to home, wanted to work on issues of education and job creation and uh, improving public safety and all the kinds of things that you get to do when you're uh, when you're in the legislature. So I, so I left after I left the army, I went to graduate school and then I went back to California. And it was not too long before I was running uh, for public office. Uh, and, 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 and in part because we have term limits in California. So I was in the state legislature. A maximum three term term limits at the time and I was just elected to my third term and I knew if I wanted to stay in public life that I needed to probably go work for President Clinton who'd been elected four years earlier uh, as he was going into a second term and so I came out to Washington uh, to talk to folks that I knew in the administration about how do you get a job in the administration and one of the jobs that was on my list they said well what are you interested in doing and at the top of my list was army secretary one of the great things about being Army Secretary is you get to travel the whole world, and you get to see soldiers who are serving our country all over the world. You know, they're in a hundred different countries every day of the year, and you see them in hot spots, and you see them in places where what they're doing, nobody even knows uh, that they're there, but they're there, and they're great ambassadors of our country. And one of the things I loved about it is that it, the tremendous diversity of that force, right? They're from every background, African-American, Latino, Asian, um, poor white kids from from rural parts of our of our country, every kind of background that you can imagine, men and women. And, and to me, they're, they're like these great ambassadors because that's the strength of our country. I, I think we have a great country that provides tremendous leadership uh, throughout the world. And we shouldn't forget that because sometimes we see the polarization and we think we're, you know, we're completely divided. Part of that is because the people who are the most extreme ends kind of capture the media and we hear a lot from them and we don't hear so much from people who are, you know, just trying to raise their families and and be responsible uh, citizens. But I think that, that the diversity that our nation has is a tremendous asset. And the truth is it's only going to grow in diversity because of the smaller, smaller planet that we occupy. And that's a good thing. Uh, Over the long run, it's a good thing because it means that as long as we're true to our principles of equality and that people can come here from anywhere and can uh, develop their talents through education and have something to contribute, can contribute something, uh, then, then that's what we need to do. The challenge for us, for our country, is that many of those uh, young people, those diverse young people, Latino, African American, and and poor white kids in Appalachia and other places, uh, don't have that opportunity to develop their talents. So we're we're wasting the talents of a lot of people because uh, because we have not uh, improved the quality of education and because we haven't made it possible for them to have things like food security and health care and. Uh, economic opportunity, jobs uh, for them to fulfill, and to see hope and a future. If we can unleash that potential, I I think that's just all to the better for our country. Um, So, you know, so I've been working on that in part on trying to say, look, Latinos are going to be the largest minority, already are the largest minority in this country, are going to be 40% of its population within 20 years. The leadership of a lot of our country in every walk of life, whether it's politics, business, arts and culture, uh, whatever it is, a fair share of it has to come out of the Latino community. So we have to take some of these really bright kids who have the potential to not just be college graduates, but go on to professional schools and uh, start businesses and do all these things and unleash it because a lot of it is being wasted right now. Oxfam America's Abby Maxman has traveled the world and has lived in areas around the globe and seen firsthand 
the desperate situations that drive people to seek refuge and a better life in America. Uh, most recently with Oxfam, I was in South Sudan, uh, a place I had spent time uh, nearly two decades earlier, and I'd lived and worked in the Horn of Africa for many years. And on the ground, uh, I was in a in an area called Okobo, uh, working and where Oxfam works to help people uh, who are local communities, but as well as uh, people who have been displaced by conflict. And we are doing work at the national and international level to uh, look at how we stop the root causes of the problem, which is the conflict that is keeping people impoverished and hungry, uh, but also looking at the resilience of some of the people who we were doing ongoing programs with. Some incredible people, a woman named Mary, who was an activist, I would call her. She's just, she would probably call herself just a, a community member who was working closely with us to help develop programs that brought women and children and, and men together to uh, do bread making activities, to have a local hair, hair salon, uh, small business activities, and also other food production uh, work and literacy programs. So the dignity and resilience people were showing in the face of acute conflict uh, is never ceases to amaze me. And we do work at all levels, the policy, the getting food and, and clean water to people who need it most, and also building the resilience and strength and building better futures for individuals. Uh, and I, it's hard, difficult for me at times to describe because even though I have spent many years, decades working with, and, and I lived for several years in a dung hut, people use the resources that are available to build walls. And so uh, the cement, if you will, to put stones and, and straw together is a mix of manure, uh, which is usually readily available in most places, and mud. And so that with um, either thatch and in some of the more wealthier households, a corrugated iron roof um, can be put on. Um, but it's exactly what it, as what it is in terms of a mix of mud, dung, stones to make walls, uh, build a thatch roof, uh, had a wooden door, uh, and a little lock and key, which always felt a little... Uh, uh, superfluous because one could really get in in any way if one needed. Um, but there was it's always difficult keeping rodents out, uh, I have to say. That was a problem. And uh, keeping your food. Uh, you know, you would have to go get food or grow what you could uh, and only have perishable uh, things that are non-perishable or that you'd have to plan very, very carefully about what you would eat each day. Uh, there was a woman named Faith who I met in South Sudan recently, 25 years old, had been displaced by conflict, had walked for almost a month with her four children uh, when I met them. They were living in, uh, they felt better because they were living in a safe space, but in a, uh, a dung mud hut, uh, had very few clothes. They didn't know where their next meal was coming from or where they could get clean water or just any of those basics. And there's uh, kind of two angles to that. One is um, one could feel, you know, what can I do to help this person and this family have agency to overcome their circumstances over time? And then that sense of how do we help them get their basic needs met at this moment in time? And people like Faith and like Mary, they really show their resilience, their desire to live in dignity and security. And it's important to bring that local to global uh, integration of uh, the experience of, of people, making sure that we're talking about a human economy, about human beings and keeping that at play. When we talk about 65 million refugees, when we talk about 800 million people going hungry every night, when we talk about the fact that the eight richest men in the world have as much wealth as the bottom 3.6 billion people in the world, that doesn't necessarily tell the story or bring the commitment and passion uh, to, it makes it feel un, unmanageable at times, the statistics of that size. So a human economy in terms of looking at what is good for people, the planet, for producers, uh, how we look at the holistic value chain of, of humanity and how we feed people and create a safe world for people.
So when I came back from South Sudan just recently, it was around the same time as the UN General Assembly, where you have all the heads of state and member states there. And I was able to sit on a high-level panel on South Sudan with those who have the power sitting around that table to end the conflict. It is within their power to do so. And I uh, was able to call out and bring my experiences and Oxfam's experiences and those who we work and collaborate with to that table and to the place of influence. Now, we know that that requires political will and a lot of other things, but we're working tirelessly uh, at all angles, whether it's behind the scenes or in those public spaces, to call out the the unacceptables and the things that we really need to change. And we do see change that happens, but we can't give up, even when we're feeling... Uh, Concerned or, or overwhelmed by the statistics and the numbers because every life and every individual matters. Chef Jose Andreas is also trying to bring about that kind of change around the world as he works with and advocates for dispossessed peoples around the world. Let's see what's happening with the refugee crisis uh, uh, back in the Middle East coming to Europe. Today that here we are having this conversation about building walls to keep people out Listen to me, you can build any wall you want to keep people out. If people are hungry, people will go over the wall, around the wall, or under the wall. This is not the way forward. The only wall conversation we should be having is walls that we're gonna build to create community kitchens, mm -hmm. schools. This is the only walls we should be thinking. For us here at home to take care of something so humble as a clean cook stove, it's almost to say, in a very selfish way, you wanna take care of your kids, you want to take care of America, as I do, as I care for my children? Start taking care of the people on the other side of where you live. Mm. Because if we take care of the people of Haiti, do you think people want to leave their homes? Nobody wants to leave the comfort of their homes, the place they belong. They don't want to go to a faraway land that they don't know. Let's provide to those people the reason of why, why they should be successful where they are, where they live. So investing in clean cook stoves is the way to make sure that Hungry people and poor people in Haiti don't decide to go into the ocean to try to come to a better world. That people in Mexico will not cross a desert to try to come to a better world. That people in Latin America will not try to go for hundreds and hundreds of miles with their families to try to come to a better world. If we start investing into the communities and stop throwing money at the problem and investing into solutions, then we will have not only the America we all want, but also the beautiful world we all hope for. We all forget that the government is in place because we, the people, vote for that government. It is true that more often than not happens that once the government makes a decision, uh, you know, nobody seems to follow up and then things go around. So foreign aid, I want every single American, right and left, Democrats and Republicans, to know that what America does around the world is something to be applauded. The leadership that America takes, not in the moments of war, but in the moments of peace and need around the world is remarkable. Uh, I saw in first person what America did in Haiti. Without America and the international community, I don't know what a country like Haiti will be like today. So we need to applaud those initiatives. Then we hear the criticism. This is where the only thing I'm gonna be asking the government and all the institutions from the United Nations to anybody else IDB, World Bank, is to start really thinking in a pro-business way when we give international aid. We need to be thinking about the return on the investment. Every dollar that comes away to do good needs to be a smart good. It's not anymore used to, oh, here, I'm going to throw money at this to hopefully the problem will go away. Ain't working anymore in the 21st century. 21st century is what's the return on the investment of every dollar we, we invest overseas? That's the answer we always need to come up. So from now on, doing good is never enough. We need to be like our man in Wall Street. If you invest, you want to make sure you're going to have a return on your investment. Shouldn't be any different with international foreign aid. This is the 21st century. The government, the role of sure is providing the right environment through subsidies. Okay, I'm not a big fan of subsidies, but making sure that those subsidies help somebody here, but then 
break everybody else around. So you cannot try to go to Africa to try to help farmers, but you are giving food aid and you are breaking down the economies in rural Africa. So in the process of trying to do good, actually you are creating more chaos. That's what I mean about doing a smart good versus good. That's the 21st century way, and I hope America and the United Nations will be leading the way. We need a call to action. The government cannot do it all. United Nations cannot do it all, but all together we can do so much. No matter how much good work we do around the world, there's always an opportunity to do better here at home. Marco Davis is the new president and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. He gave his perspective on how we can create a culture of inclusion that allows our fellow countrymen and women to thrive. Diversity is about who's around the table, right? Diversity is is often about bringing different people together um, who have different perspectives, different life experiences, and, and being explicit and deliberate about the fact that whereas there's you can define diversity many, many different ways, a key component in the United States is, is race and gender, um, followed very, very closely by socioeconomic status, right? But so making sure you have people who grew up in different economic backgrounds and bring that to the table, making sure you have people of different races and ethnicities, and of course people of different genders um, a, a, on your team, right? To, to, pull it, to put it most specifically in an organization. Uh, inclusion, in fact, a, a, a friend and colleague once said, you know, diversity is uh, being invited to the party, right? But inclusion is being asked to dance. <laughs> inclusion is really about changing the dynamic yeah. of the relationships and people being able to bring their full selves to their, to their mm-hmm. work, people being able to raise issues that they're concerned about, people feeling like their perspectives I- are equally heard and valued, right? So that's the inclusion part, which is not the same as just having different people, mm-hmm. right? Because if you right. have different people but the same folks talk, it's not yeah. sufficient, right? And that was the I part. And then equity is about both how and on what you base decisions and where you dedicate time and resources and what impact you have, right? So once you have those, and in my mind, they're somewhat in a way sequential, where once you have diversity and inclusion, you start thinking about, wait, how are we engaging the community we serve? Wait, how are we deciding who we support, who we work with? How are we deciding um, whose perspectives we seek out and bring in? How are we deciding where we do our work, what communities we choose to work in, and those kinds of things, right? Because then you start to discover, like, there are, pl- and, and uh, bringing it back again, you know, uh, in, in food, there's a very, very obvious piece that until people mapped it, no one noticed, is that you have entire food deserts in communities, right? Right. You have communities and areas where there's just restaurants and supermarkets and groceries and fresh fruit and local and like all of that movement just booming. And then, you know, a mile away, you have a place where folks cannot get fresh fruit at all, right? And that's an equity question, right? right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of in my mind equity about decisions about where things, how things happen and, and where resources go. The name proximity actually comes from a concept by Brian Stevenson of Just Mercy yeah. and of the new yep. museum and memorial in Alabama, um, uh, where uh, his the, the wisdom, I think, of his grandmother was that you really can't solve the world's problems from a distance. You have to get up close. You have to be proximate to really challenge that. And so our focus on leaders of color is that they have uh, greater likelihood, if not, in fact, proximity to the issues that they're working on. And therefore, um, that's some insight and some added value that they bring mm-hmm. to the table. I'm Billy Shore, and I hope this special edition of Add Passion and Stir has offered you a model of respectful dialogue for a much-needed conversation about immigration and diversity in our country. It's often hard to know what each of us as individuals can do to respond to the relentless daily attacks on bedrock American values of equality, tolerance, and inclusion. But if you're like me, and believing that silence is incompatible with conscience, one place to begin is sharing constructive examples of how we can and should talk about these issues. Please subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast app, and leave a rating and review, and don't forget to share Ad Passion and Stir with your community. Ad Passion and Stir is distributed by District Productive. Our executive producer is Peter Ogburn. Ad Passion and Stir is the creation of Billy Shore, Debbie Shore, and Paul Woody Woodhull.